I make videos about great cities around the world, but sometimes ignorant suburbanites tell me that America is too big to have good cities. So the best urbanism in North America must be the small countries, right? Let's go to the map! Hmm, definitely not Canada, I know that for sure. Mexico, maybe? No, still too big. Cuba? I don't know. Wait a second, what's this? The Bahamas! Yes, that's it! Great urbanism, here I come! Alright, I'm ready to see the best design cities in North America. <sighs> Damn it! So I took a trip to the Bahamas recently, a beautiful land of sun, sand, sea, and swimming pigs. And I met up with my friend who runs the YouTube channel Foreign Man in a Foreign Land, who is Bahamian and grew up there. For the purpose of this video, I'll just refer to him as Foreign because you internet weirdos don't need to know his real name. Although, now that he moved back to the Bahamas from the US, is he even foreign anymore? Like, uh, whatever. The Bahamas is actually a really interesting place. If you look at GDP per capita, the Bahamas is actually the third wealthiest country in North America after the US and Canada. Of course, about 70% of that GDP comes from tourism and related industries, and the tourism industry employs about half the population. Of course, I can't go anywhere without thinking about urban planning and transportation, and this trip was no exception. But what I found most interesting is that a lot of the planning problems found in the Bahamas are universal. They're the same issues being seen by many other cities in the world, and especially in the US and Canada. The Bahamas is a collection of nearly 700 coral islands, but only 30 of them are inhabited, and about three quarters of the population lives on one island called New Providence, which is pretty much made up of one city called Nassau. Wait, what did you just say? What? Nassau? For the love of God. My brother in Christ, I beg you, please, say it with me. Nassau. Oh, Nassau. Yeah, yeah, that's good enough for government's work. Uh, okay. NASA, like the space program, I got it. Mm hmm? On this trip, I stayed on this island of New Providence, home to about 270,000 people. So, this is not a particularly populous island, but you would never know it from the traffic. So why is it that such a small island with such a small population has so much traffic? Well, it's the same reason why there's lots of traffic in my hometown or pretty much anywhere else, because there's no solution to car traffic except viable alternatives to driving. Despite New Providence, the entire island, being slightly smaller than the city of Amsterdam, there are very few ways to get around without driving. Now, there is public transportation in Nassau, the Jitneys. These are small minibuses that are bigger than taxis but smaller than a typical bus and are used by both tourists and locals. Of course, the fundamental problem with the Jitneys is the same problem found all over the US and Canada. They get stuck in the same traffic as the cars. When I visit a new city for the first time, this is one of the first things I look for. Do the buses get stuck in traffic? If so, then they're not a viable alternative to driving and they will do nothing to reduce traffic congestion. This is a well-studied result and it even has its own name, the Downs-Thompson Paradox. I have a previous video about this effect, but essentially, car traffic will increase until it's faster to take public transit. This means that public transit can reduce car congestion as long as it's allowed to be faster than driving by having its own dedicated lane to bypass traffic. But if buses get stuck in the same traffic as the cars, then there will be virtually no limit to road congestion. Which is how a small island of less than 300,000 people can have such crippling traffic. 
My foreign friend had actually never taken public transit in Nassau, despite growing up there. Like many people in the Bahamas, he had spent his whole life only getting around by driving. But that's not very surprising because I've heard the same thing from many people in the US, Canada, or anywhere else where the buses get stuck in traffic. There's a stigma against public transportation, which is inevitable when it's designed as an inferior mode of transit. Why would anybody take the bus when it gets stuck in the same traffic as the cars? But I wanted to see what it was like to get around by public transportation, so I did some research and convinced Foreign to take a bus ride with me. That research was hard, however, because there is no official map of the Jitney routes in Nassau. Yeah, because the Jitneys are all run by different companies and are organized independently. The Jitneys have route numbers, so there is some semblance of organization, but the drivers sometimes alter their routes if deemed necessary. The closest thing I could find to an official route map was this PDF on the Bahamian government website with text descriptions of the routes. This likely isn't a problem to the people who grew up taking transit here, but it's yet another barrier to entry to any casual user which made this system totally foreign to foreign. But we asked around and figured out which routes would take us into downtown Nassau. The first trick was finding the bus stop, which wasn't particularly easy in a resort area that is designed primarily for driving. We had to cross through a few parking lots, but there were still more sidewalks than American suburbia, so that was a plus. They had rental scooters too, but I didn't see anybody using them the whole time I was there. Um, this doesn't count. When we did find the bus stop, it was much fancier than I expected, though pretty much everything is carefully manicured in the tourist areas. Not all parts of the island are this well cared for though, and we'll get to that later in the video. We had to wait a while, but I didn't mind because the weather is literally perfect. I mean, it is a tourist destination for a reason. But it did make me think about all those people who blame the weather for why their cities are so car-centric. This is a nonsense argument anyway, because lots of people walk and cycle in Amsterdam where it rains all the time, and in Olu, Finland, where it gets down below minus 25 each winter, and there's really no correlation between weather and car dependency, it's just a lame excuse. But it's always really striking to go to a place with effectively perfect weather and see that it's still car dependent. I felt the same way when I was living in California. Why is this place not designed to be the cycling capital of the world? After about 10 minutes, our jitney arrived, and we weren't even the only people taking it. We sat up front with the driver, and Foreign quizzed him about who takes the jitneys, where they go, and what it's like to drive a jitney in Nassau. He told us that most of the people on this route were going to or from work at the resorts, though sometimes tourists also use the jitneys to get downtown. As you can probably tell, this is one of the better developed parts of the island. Each jitney holds about 30 people, and the middle aisle can be turned into a jump seat for when it's over capacity. The bus stops in the non-touristy areas were much less impressive, sometimes just a sign at the side of the road. But the bus stops are only a suggestion anyway, and many people just flag down a jitney wherever they happen to be standing. You pay the driver directly at the end of your journey before leaving the bus. It's $1.25 and you need to have exact change. This is another point of friction for taking transit, needing to carry exact change. We paid our driver and exited the Jitney downtown at the main bus station. Well, not really a station per se, but a street where all the Jitneys converge. The Jitney system is a hub and spoke model centered around downtown and our driver told us that most people take two Jitneys to get to their destination and they transfer downtown. However, since the Jitneys are all run independently, if you take two Jitneys, you have to pay twice. Another quirk is that the Jitneys do not go to Paradise Island because the resort there, Atlantis, doesn't allow them. I'm legitimately not sure how the people who work there get to the resort. As soon as we stepped onto the main street, I was overwhelmed by vehicle exhaust. There's a certain smell, no, not a smell, more like a feeling in your face and lungs from old gasoline engines. I was actually reminded of this the other day in Amsterdam when I passed this classic car. More like classic lung cancer, am I right? 
I was genuinely surprised at just how much traffic there was along Bay Street. And with all these cars and minimal trees, it felt hot and unpleasant to walk. Good thing I had my old white man's hat to keep me cool, eh? Though a few streets had these great porticos and it was noticeably cooler in the shade. This is true almost everywhere. Trees and shade make hot places more pleasant. The cruise ships drop off right around this area, and there are a bunch of kitschy souvenir shops and jewelry shops, but most people don't walk very far along this street. Certainly not as far along as we walked. During our walk, we actually ran into some old family friends of foreigns, and they told us that it hasn't always been this way. Bay Street used to be a quieter two-way street, but about 15 years ago, it was converted to a one-way street in order to speed up car traffic, with Bay Street going east and Shirley Street going west. Unfortunately, high-speed cars aren't compatible with a lively street with lots of foot traffic, and many of the businesses along this stretch of Bay Street have gone out of business. And the farther we walked, the more depressing the streetscape became having lots of cars really sucks the life out of a place. This again is such a familiar problem that is seen all over North America. When downtown streets are redesigned to move as much traffic as possible, life on the street suffers, sometimes with disastrous results. It was also interesting that Ford hadn't really noticed that downtown had deteriorated so much. He drives through this area regularly, but you notice so much more about your city when walking compared to driving. This is so typical in the rest of North America as well. People have no concept of the state of their city because they only see it at high speed from behind a windshield. They don't even realize that their city is crumbling. So I challenge you, if you drive everywhere where you live, try walking it sometime. You'll see your city in a totally different way. Speaking of noticing things, I realized on our walk that every bank here is Canadian, which is really weird. I also appreciate that all the government buildings in the Bahamas are painted pink. Nice touch. And there were some nice newer projects like this pedestrianized square, though these were primarily aimed at tourists who arrived downtown by a cruise ship. We walked along Bay Street for a while and eventually stopped to have some authentic Bahamian Chinese food. We continued our walk along Shirley Street, the other street that was turned into a one-way through fare for cars, before heading back to Jitney Central to pick up our ride home. The Jitneys were surprisingly functional and reasonably priced, but it was extremely frustrating to get stuck in the same traffic as the cars. One of the most meaningful things they could do here is to give the Jitneys their own dedicated lane, which would make it a faster option than driving for some people. For example, there are many Latin American cities with bus rapid transit lines that are functional and efficient, and Nassau could definitely benefit from this kind of transit infrastructure. Unfortunately, there are places you just can't go with a jitney, so the rest of our exploration was done by car. The newer parts of Nassau outside the downtown are very, shall we say, American-inspired. Everything is very car-centric, and you're not even guaranteed to find a sidewalk. There's a road that runs around downtown, which is quite efficient, and this is where more through traffic should be rerouted instead of through the city center. But this also becomes very strode-like in places, very much like any new development in America. It's obvious that this is a car-centric place, so it shouldn't be surprising that most people get around by car. And if you've been paying attention, there's one thing you haven't really seen yet, and that's anybody on a bicycle. Apparently you'll sometimes see rich people on racing bikes on the weekends, but the entire time we explored the island, we only saw about half a dozen people cycling. Clearly a bicycle is not a regular form of transportation here. But again, New Providence is smaller than Amsterdam, but with much, much nicer weather. It should be trivially easy to get around on bikes, so why don't more people use them? Well, it's the same reason as most other places in North America. It's not safe. There's just too much car traffic for most people to feel comfortable riding a bicycle, so the only people who do it are those who have no other choice. But this is crazy, right? 
You could cycle to almost any destination on the island in less than 30 minutes, which could literally be faster than driving in all this traffic. Sure, there are some hills in Nassau, but nothing insurmountable, and even if you had to take a detour to avoid one, it can't be that far. Plus, an e-bike is still way cheaper than a car. A proper network of separated bicycle paths could literally transform transportation on this island at a very low cost. Unfortunately, there's an even bigger social stigma against riding a bicycle here than taking public transit, though I do wonder how quickly that culture would change if a bicycle became the fastest way to get around. The Bahamas still shows the effects of segregation as well. The British ended their slave trade in 1807, and over the coming decades, thousands of slaves were liberated from foreign slave ships and resettled in the Bahamas. But while these slaves were free, they were certainly not treated equally, and they were only permitted to live in certain neighborhoods in Nassau. They were also not allowed to stay downtown after they were finished working. This became even worse when this guy, Ralph G. Collins, decided that during the Great Depression, he would fund a make-work project to build a wall around his sprawling property, which ended up cutting off many people from downtown. The wall was mostly torn down in the 1960s, but parts of it remain and you can still see the effects of this today, with nice, large, well-maintained buildings on one side and small, crumbling buildings on the other. Incidentally, the Make Work project in the 1930s in Amsterdam was to plant a forest on the edge of town which became Het Amsterdamse Bos, which is really nice. Meanwhile, the areas cut off by Collins Wall are still extremely poor even today. There are houses here that don't even have proper running water or sewage systems and communal water pumps are used by everyone in the area. And yet, there are still lots of cars as there aren't a lot of good alternatives for getting around. Like many tropical tourist destinations, New Providence is a very wealthy island, but that wealth is very unequally distributed. But the car-centric nature of its transportation system makes it even more difficult, as it increases the transportation time and cost for anybody who can't afford an automobile. Ultimately, Nassau was not what I expected, and I was left with more questions than answers. This was a place that ended up with very similar problems to the US and Canada, but with a very different history. This video started as a challenge to Foreign to spend one day with me without his beloved gas guzzler, but in the end, he realized that taking public transit and walking instead of driving revealed a lot about his hometown that he didn't expect. It inspired him to investigate how Nassau ended up this way by speaking to many of the people directly involved in that history. And he's made a fascinating video about what he's found. I can strongly recommend it. He explores the topics of racial capitalism and colonialism, topics that should be discussed more often. But the last thing the internet needs is another old white guy talking about race, so I encourage you to hear it from him. There's a link to his video in the description. I am really thankful that I was able to visit the Bahamas and to travel with a local who could show me what it's really like there, outside of the posh resorts. But one of the things I consider when traveling like this is my impact on the climate. It is possible to buy carbon offsets to reduce some of this impact, but the carbon offsets market is full of companies that don't really provide the benefits they promise. Wendover Productions has made a great video about some of the major problems with the carbon offsets market if you'd like to learn more. So I was very surprised to see a Wendover sponsorship for Ren, who is also the sponsor of this video. Are Ren really a better option for carbon offsets? I spent some time looking into it and yes, I believe they are. Carbon offsets are only as good as their evaluation criteria and I think that's what sets Ren apart from the rest. For example, REN only has seven active projects, and they spend a significant amount of time regularly reviewing the efficacy of those projects. This is not some stick it and forget it tree planting scheme. These are active programs that are regularly monitored. If you're still not sold, that's fine, but you might want to check out their website before giving up on the idea because there's a lot of good and honest information on there. Of course, the best solution is to not emit that carbon in the first place, which is why I try to take electric trains as much as possible when traveling. Though, I was having a lot of trouble finding a train to the Bahamas. 
But the next best thing is to offset those emissions, and that's why I'm glad there's REN. By answering a few questions about your lifestyle, you can calculate your carbon output and how to reduce it. Of course, no one can reduce their carbon output to zero, but you can offset what you have left. Once you sign up to make a monthly contribution, you receive monthly updates on the projects you support. You get to see what your money is being spent on, with photos and details on every tree planted, every acre reforested, every ton of carbon offset. If this sounds good to you, then I encourage you to check out REN by using the link in the description. The first 100 people to sign up with my link will get their first month of subscription for free. Thanks to REN for sponsoring this video. I'd also like to thank my supporters on Patreon and Nebula who pay me to film Traffic in Paradise. If you'd like to support the channel, visit nebula.tv slash notjustbikes or patreon.com slash notjustbikes.